Well, first most, I'd like to thank you all for traveling near and far, for taking the time out from your heavy schedules and marking this spectacular morning with your glorious presence. Thank you so much for coming today. This past few years has seen a tremendous change and exponential growth in the field of eye care in Nepal. One side, there has been a significant contribution by optometric educators to regulate and regularize the professions of optometry in this country. On the other side, the optometry profession has expanded its wings by significant contribution in the area of academy, research, clinical care, innovation, development, and to the community at large. This prestigious eye care profession has recognized its need to stay upgraded and updated in the profession by conducting and participating in the forum. One such pinnacle moment in the prestigious journey is this symposium on contact lens and vision therapy 2019, a forum to discuss, deliberate, exchange, and explore technical and clinical expertise in the field of eye care. Listening to these experts is a great opportunity for either faculty attending the forum and we want you ladies and gentlemen to interact, imbibe knowledge and to get inspired. As a courtesy to others, we kindly ask you to please silence or turn off your cell phones and please refrain from distracting others from excessive movements and conversations. And just as well, we ask that you are respectful to us as speaker, your fellow attendees, the coordinators, and the volunteers. Believe you me, this is going to be an increasing, engaging, and stimulating experience to all of us for sure. Everything that has happened to us in the past and everything that will happen to us in the future is an integral part of our story. And thus, an integral part of who we are. So it's really important to tell their story. Here we have graduated from Eli School of Optometry in 1989. Dr. Aditya Goyal completed his MS in Clinical Optometry from Pennsylvania College of Optometry, Salas University. More than this, you are instrumental in establishing large number of optometry colleges in famous cities of India, including Chennai, Bengaluru, Ludhiana, all of which are eye hospitals. Besides this, he is a board of as board of the Association of School and College of Optometry in India and currently serves as the President of ASCO India. Let's welcome him with huge round of applause. So the first talk for time is supposed to be talking about this, about vision therapy, what we do. What do you think is vision therapy? A lot of people talk about vision therapy. So what exactly is vision therapy according to you? Any thoughts? I'm not going to teach you vision therapy form. The, the word B. What is vision therapy according to you? What do you think is vision therapy? How many of you can do vision therapy? One, two, three, four. Only four? Five? Okay. Now what is vision therapy? You said you do vision therapy, so what is that? It's programmed by exercises guided on this under the supervision. Do we have another one? Yes. Okay, Hira says it's a programmed set of exercises so that a person improves his visual efficiency, etc. under supervision of optical methods. I don't know why it should be optical methods, but maybe anyway. Okay. So, my question is, do you people recommend exercise? Yes. All of you? Yes. I see a lot of my ops over here. You guys do some exercise? Yes. So, VT is nothing but exercising the eyes, but is it just that? Do we just talk at exercising? What exactly is vision therapy? Do we understand? When we talk vision, do we understand what we mean by vision? A very good friend of mine, Dr. Nancy Tollerson, who practices in the US, she made this fantastic statement someday. How many of you, I know all my students have done a lot of screening. Day in, day out, you guys are doing screenings. Do you think it makes sense to you guys to do those things? Yes, no. 
a whole lot of uh, school screenings you people have done. I don't know how many thousands and thousands of children you guys have screened. Did it make sense to you? Be very, very frank. I'm not going to deduct any marks now. <laughs> I've got nothing to do. You've got your babies, you've got everything. So, uh, <clears throat> did you did you think did you, uh, doing those Snell and Aquities made sense to you guys? So Nancy made the statement. She said, if I had a magic wand, I would get rid of all the Snell and I jars in school vision screenings across the United States. And she was talking to the United States and not India and Nepal. Okay? We were discussing this yesterday. The test originated in the 1800s and is great for looking at small static symbol at 20 feet away, but it's in no way a reliable measurement of visual needs a child requires for learning, life, and sports. Why does she say that? 2020, <clears throat> all of you do one of our 2020s. You upload one eye, you check 2020. You upload the other eye, you check 2020. Child is fine. Okay? What does she say? Does your 2020 ever check near vision? All of you are doing for distance. What makes you think a child can see for you? Do you think a child can never have a synovia? He can. So can see me at near, which is critical to reading, writing, desk work, computer work, etc. You are exposing a child. Today's child is exposed to every kind of gadget. The born working on mobiles. How do you know that the vision is fine for that? How do you know that the child's eye can aim and work in a coordinated team? Unfortunately, all of us are born with two eyes. I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate. Because I teach binocular vision and all of you curse me. Had there been only monocular vision, then I will not be teaching you guys. So, are both the eyes aiming at the object? If I'm looking at one particular thing, if I'm looking over here, are both my eyes looking at this? We don't know. The school screens, what we do, do not tell us that. They don't tell me if the eyes are moving appropriately. Do we check pursuit circuits? No. Is it, okay, let me ask you a question. Is pursuit circuit a function of extra persons? Yes, no. So where does it start from? Where's the origination of pursuits and circuits? It originates in the brain stem. It goes to the vestibular complex, it goes to your supranuclear areas, and that initiates your pursuits and circuits. If I am not able to move my eyes appropriately, if I am not able to move from one word to another, one letter to another, one person to another, if I am overshooting, undershooting, doing whatever, will I be able to see properly? I will not be able to read properly. If I don't read properly, is it a fault of the child that he's poor in studies? It is not a fault of the child, fault of the entire system and our own system where we are not <coughs> uh, diagnosing anything properly. And the child goes footballing around to different places. Has adequate eye movements to allow eyes to rapidly and accurately shift along a printed page. Most of us don't even understand that we do not put the perform pursuit movements to read, we perform secondary movements to read. We don't follow up with a line. We jump from one word to another and do a big second from the last word to the next line. Can maintain clear vision at varying distances. We are checking only at one single distance. We are not checking at varying distances. Rapidly it just focus to copy from the board or watch the ball coming when getting ready to bat as headaches from eye springs. When a child complains, we say he's making excuses. He does not want to study, so he's making excuses. When the child sleeps while studying, he said that he's lazy, he does not want to study. Has poor visual motor integration that impacts printing or cursive writing. This brings me to a single point. What is vision? What do you understand from vision? Is vision just seen? So what exactly is vision? Now, 
poor visual motor integration skills, eye-hand coordination. Now, eye-hand coordination is not from here to here outside. Eye-hand coordination is here and then goes all the way back and comes my So, unless that visual motor integration is appropriate, he will not be able to write properly. And when the child is not writing properly, he fails his exams and he starts blaming has properly functioning visual memory and visual integration skills. We are not checking any of these skills when we do our screens. And that's why she said, I will throw away all those Snellens charts in the United States. I'm sure we should be doing that in India also. We should be doing that in Asia. 2020 gives a false sense of security. Uh, security. Vision is much, much, much more than just seeing 2020 and saying the child is fine. These are the symptoms. Blurred vision, double vision, car sickness. Can you can you relate car sickness to vision? Sorry? Vestibular system, a lot of exophobia. If you have a huge exophobia, invariably you will have car, system, uh, car sickness. You're not going to be stable because if you're breathing by the if you have a phoria, a huge phoria, if you're breathing in a moving vehicle, imagine what's going to happen to you. Headaches, fatigue from reading or using a computer, itchy eyes, watery eyes. What do we do? Prescriber? <coughs> yes. Tears. Is that a solution? We have not even gone into the depth of it, what, what the problem is. Nausea or disease when reading or at computer. Avoidance of close work. Closing or covering. I do read. If a person does this, what is he trying to achieve? He has a problem binocularly, so he just goes like this, he becomes monocular and he starts breathing. That's when my first question would be asked when I'm asking, when I'm talking to parents or anybody, is to lie down and breathe. Invariably, the answer is yes. Now just think what is happening when they lie down and breathe. They go like this on one side and see what has happened. I become monocular because that is happening naturally because we as optometrists, we are not able to diagnose and ultimately we end up, the child ends up using his own ways to find the solutions. Reading problems, concentration difficulty, losing your place when reading, learning problems, difficulty remembering what you read, frowning or squinting while reading. Attention problems, slow reading, difficulty finishing timed assignments. Now these are the symptoms. Do we ever check of any of these on any of these symptoms when we evaluate a child or by a child anyway? And a person comes with a headache, a person comes with eye strain, do we ask for all these symptoms? Let's look at these cases. <clears throat> you can read it. Twelve-year-old boy presented with a history of blurred vision after five ten minutes of feeding. Reports of high strength, initial history and testing to consider non-functional causes for negative visual activity 2023. Next case, 20 year old college student presented with complaints of blurry vision and discomfort around his eyes after 15 minutes of reading. Visual activity 2020 both times. How many of us get these kind of cases? Every single day we get so many of these cases. 18 year old presented with complaints of inability to read comfortably for more than 10 minutes, after 10 minutes, eyes burnt. Print became blurry and if she continued, experienced double vision, visual activity, Fifteen year old, 10th grader presented with a history of asynopia associated with short periods of short period for reading. Activity pretty different. What is your diagnosis? What do we do now in such cases? What do you guys do? We have an umbrella of ophthalmologists in the hospitals. He said, okay, fine, 20, 20, everything is fine. Send to the ophthalmologist. Ophthalmologist writes some placebo. Uh, <coughs> Invariably, what I see is a small minus 0.25 given or plus, uh, minus, uh, plus 0.25 given or some small amount of cylinder. What we guys do is we have to find something. So we find a 0.25 cylinder at some funny axis, prescribe. Ophthalmologist prescribes that along with a tear substitute. And we said he will be fine. When the patient is not fine, he goes to all these people, ENT, 
neurologist, psychologist, everything, he's footballing around and he gets fed up of getting football. He says, okay, fine. Probably that is how the world helps. Okay. What did these people have? Case one, accommodative excess. We always feel accommodative, good amount of accommodation. He has a fantastic accommodation. You say it's fine, it's very good. There's a problem. Accommodative insufficiency, convergence excess. When I was studying my bachelor's, these guys used to teach me, okay, fine, I you can converge right up to here, maybe beyond the head, and it's great. <laughs> Fantastic convergence, right? That's what we have got. Up to the tip of the nose. Convergence excess, it's not right. You have a problem. Fusional convergence dysfunction. The whole part of system is in dysfunction. And <coughs> visual acne is going to be pretty good. It's fine. We do not have, because we have not evaluated the patient. What do we do as operators? non service by other vision disorders, highly prevalent conditions. Highly, highly prevalent conditions. If all of you do so many of the so many prevalent studies, find out the perceptual disorders, find out the non service by other vision disorders. Huge prevalence. Most prevalent condition other than refractive error. All of us are talking so much about myopia. Anyone bother about it? What do we do? Prescribe the glasses. 0.25, because 0.5, 0.5, 0.75, and so on. Problem was not myopia, problem was something else. But then, if you have exophoria, how many of you have exophorias? Others would not have checked. <laughs> okay. When you have exophoria, what do you think you will accept? Minus or plus? Minus. Your eyes are going out. Minus. Okay, you will accept minus. Okay? Eyes become straight. Your brain starts getting used to it, eyes go out further. You come to a stupid optometrist like me, I'll press my minus. Minus becomes increasing. I keep on eating exophobia. I keep on eating. So minus keeps on increasing. Have we done something at that time? Have we found out that this person had exophoria, huge exophoria which needed correction, would you require minus glasses? No. I'm quite certain a lot of you don't require those glasses or you wear. I was just telling her during the break, uh, we had a patient in Bangor, I'm sure one of you must have seen that patient. Uh, he was, uh, he, he used to come to us every, every year, probably about six months, every six months. He was, uh, when he came to us, he was minus five or something. Every year we were increasing his minus. One fine day, the ophthalmologist said, I think something else is wrong. So he sent that person to the vision therapy clinic. I happened to be there at the clinic that day on, uh, in uh, Bangalore. And we did something like uh, a test called NRA PR. All of you know that I am nicknamed NRA PR. Yeah. All my spirits, Dinesh is there. These days you should call me NRA, right? <laughs> yeah, so we did NRA the one him and I found NRA was very huge. What did it mean? He was over minus. So we psychologized him. That minus five came down to about minus one or minus two. Still NRA was quite high. I took his permission and propionized him. Can you, can you make a wild guess what the power was? A plus something. It was a plus three. A plus three hyper was given minus five glasses and he was fine. I can assure you, each one of you, I can get you to whatever minus you want over a period of time. And that's what we did. We batted our backs by prescribing those high men. We were giving him 2020 every single time he came. He had 2020. With plus three also he had 2020. And you can understand as our commentaries how difficult it is to get used to a plus lens as compared to what we were giving him. We were just giving the points. Treatment very successful with vision therapy. Treatment you have to understand automatically. It's not vision therapy as such. You have to understand automatically. It's a part of automatically. We are not doing anything uh, 
great that we say we are doing vision therapy. Lenses, prisms, vision therapy, vision training, these are the treatment options. A successful treatment leads to significant improvement in quality of life for the patient. All of us are interested in quality of life. Yesterday we were talking. I said on Fridays I should be in Bangladesh or Pakistan. Saturdays I should be in Nepal. Sundays in India. Why? Three days of holidays in a week. Uh, this is my favorite slide. Do we have any ophthalmologists here? Nobody? Do we have operators here? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't we put anything from this slide? This is a real-time study that has been done in the Eye Institute in Pennsylvania. There is a, a, to Salus University, the attached hospital is called the Eye Institute. So this is the prevalent study which was done. You check the amount of patients that they have got. This is what is ophthalmology. The retina, anterior segment of paper. What's the percentage? Probably about 5% maximum. 95% is U.S. How many of you are doing this? Hypropia, acetamidazone, myopia, non-stereoscopic disorder, stereoscopic amblyopia. All this is optometrist domain. <coughs> In India, we people keep drink. We are not allowed to prescribe drugs. In the US, they say, okay, we are allowed to prescribe drugs, but we are not allowed to operate. What we miss out is this part. Even in the US, they are not interested because it requires thinking. Surgery, very strict. Medication, very strict. Prescribe whatever you feel like. But what I always keep saying is, from here to here, who is going to do? Because ophthalmologists do not know that. And when I'm lecturing at the ophthalmologist conference, I always talk about, I said, you guys keep making so much of you and cry about this. Just the three to five percent that you do. The rest of it is my work. Ninety-five percent of eye care is done by me. Only five percent is done by you. Why are you bloating so much about it? <laughs> Today we talk so much about prevalence, evidence-based technology, evidence-based medicine. Ophthalmologist asks me, I having a dinner with an ophthalmologist from Bombay and he says, you know what, the problem with your vision therapy is there's no evidence. So I had my friends. I said, okay, fine. I said, I'll allow you to talk. He talked, 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 there's no this, there's no that. I said, okay, now I've listened to you enough. Now you keep quiet, I'll talk. And you listen to me. I said, okay, fine. Can you please tell me the evidence that is there for strabismus surgery? Is there any evidence on earth which tells you that in exotropia, lateral rectus was small and medial rectus was large? Is there any evidence at all? Is there any instrument which has been invented by any ophthalmologist which can measure the power of the muscles? No. Can you give me in writing any ophthalmologist, any strabismologist across earth who can give me in writing that after surgery the eyes will become straight and remain straight forever and give functional vision? No. When you do not have any evidence for any of these things, why are you operating? You do not have evidence and you ask me evidence, yes I have evidence. But before asking any evidence for what I'm doing, I want evidence for what you are doing. You do not have any evidence for what you are doing all these years, but then all this is evidence, what we have, evidence-based medicine. We have a lot of evidence. Yes, I do not have randomized controlled studies. I was talking in the uh, US uh, in April. A patient of traumatic brain injury was shot in his stomach may be treating him. Can I do randomized control study among those patients? Can I get 100 patients, 50 I say I will not do any treatment and 50 I will do treatment? No. It's not possible to do a, an RCT on such patients. 
So why are you asking me what do we need? We require patient's welfare, we want patient to be treated, we want the symptoms to come down, we want the patient to be effective in whatever he is doing. And with whatever I am doing, I am not harming him, I am providing him some relief. If I am doing that, I don't think there should be any reason why we should not be allowed, why we should not be allowed to do vision therapy. And very surprising, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, everything is covered by insurance. For vision therapy, they said it is experimental science, so we will not cover. What more evidence we want? Strabismus surgery is covered by insurance. Where is the evidence? Is that not an experimental science? Approach to vision therapy or anything that we do, very simple. Present simple diagnostic routine. I'll be talking about that in the afternoon if you want to listen to me again. Emphasize on case analysis. Again, very simple. It's not a rocket science that we talk about. It's very, very simple, straightforward stuff. And present a simple sequential treatment approach. You just need to understand that and you can do it. Diagnostic routine. We'll be doing this in the afternoon, so I don't want to go through this now. And present a sequential treatment approach and work as a team. That's most important. It's not that this is my case and only I get to, and this is this case and only he gets We have to work as a team. Read this. All of us dabble with lenses and prisms. Did you know that the plus lenses reduce chronicity of postural musculature? If we get plus lenses, it changes your muscular, musculature, the tonicity of the musculature. Binocular plus reduces tonicity of the lower back. Monocular reduces of the upper back. They expand the visual space volume. They emphasize background as opposed to figure. They make the reflective child more field dependent, increasing his speed. I can change the speed of the person. I can change the way he looks at things and works on it. It's very simple. No rocket science, it's pure science. I can prove it to you right now. There's a trial set for SC over there, I can prove it to you. My second slide, I can show you everything. Based down to this, monocular or yoke, who visual space offers from one's center of gravity. Pure science. I can make your speed slow, I can make your speed fast. I can do all that. They move the eyes upward, chin moves upward and forward, center of gravity shifts forward, pelvis shifts to tilt downwards, body moves forwards on toes, de-emphasize figure and emphasize ground. How many of us understand figure ground perception? How many of you have patients where the mother or the father comes and says, my child is totally cluttered. He is just not able to find things. If I tell him you pick up this and he keeps searching for it all over, he's right in front of his eyes, he can't see. It's not that he cannot see, he can very well see, he has 20 20 visual equity. But he has a physical ground perception problem. Among this bunch, if a person has a physical ground perception problem, he will not be able to point out, okay, find person A, person B, person C. No. He'll have a lot of difficulty. He'll be looking at that person and still missing it out. He'll be looking at the object and still missing it out. There's a problem with the problem. These are the behavioral properties of prisms and lenses which unfortunately we do not learn. We do not teach in order. I think we should be teaching all these in the first semester or second semester so that it gets ingrained in the head. We just talk about lenses, keep 0.25, keep increasing. What are we trying to do? I'll give you a very simple example. When you look through a plain glass, absolute zero power, a perfect glass, window glass, do you think it is it is transparent all of us more? <coughs> do you think it is the same as having no glass? Why? It's plain glass. It has no power, it has nothing, it has no refractive properties at all. Why do you feel that there's something there? Behavioral problems. And a plain class changes your behavior. 
to give a pain class to a person which find the change of this pain. How many of you have seen Tare Zamipa, My Name is Khan and all these movies? A lot of you must have seen that. What did Shah Rukh Khan have? My name is Khan. What did he have? I saw the number of hands go. Asperger's syndrome. What is Asperger's syndrome? Do you think you guys as operators can do something for Asperger's syndrome? Huge load. You can change a person's dimension altogether. How many have heard of autism spectrum disorder? How many of you have heard of it? How many of you have heard of attention deficit disorder? Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. All of you must have heard of it. Do you know it's all a part of ASD, autism spectrum disorder? <coughs> autism spectrum disorder is not autism. Autism is the end part of the spectrum. You can have mild autism, the autism spectrum, you can have higher. So the final one, the guy who has a maximum amount of autism, I mean, the, the problem, he is autistic. As per the syndrome comes in between this. That is something the body that small kid has. Yes, Steve. Now, Amir Khan made him normal. Shah Rukh Khan became a hero. Doesn't happen day to day life. It happens only in movies. But believe me, we can do that. We may not be able to. I do not say that I can treat autism. No way. I cannot treat autism. I cannot treat autism spectrum disorder. I cannot treat ADD. Nobody on earth. Whichever, whichever science you may take. But what we can do is we can make a person's life a lot better. A human being's life a lot better. Okay. And please do not consider them affected. They are much, much, much superior to us. <clears throat> so what do we do in these cases? ADD, ADHD, ASD, CP, dyslexia, TBI. You see the prevalence of these things? Huge prevalence. <coughs> what do we do in these cases? The perceptual disorders. When we don't find that out, we do not have the capacity to find out that a person has a problem, or this problem, how do we treat that? You don't even know what it is. It's a team approach. You, you require neurologists, psychologists, pediatricians, ophthalmologists, physiotherapists, operators, the speech therapists, so special educators, and a behavioral and developmental optometrist and a visual therapist. It's a team work. We need to work as a team and help the person. I think that's what medical science is all about helping a human being. When we do not diagnose, when we do not work, today there becomes something like a right hand or left hand, okay fine, the right eye is fine, the left eye is this. All of us want to make money from that. But then I am sure we can make money as a team also. <coughs> Perceptual deficiencies. How many of you know all these? These are non motor perceptual disorders. Or perceptual functions, non motor of perceptual functions, visual discrimination, visual memory, visual spatial relationships, form constancy, visual spatial sequential memory, visual filler count, visual closure, all the functions of vision. Do we work on any of these? Even in masters, when we teach all this, nobody is interested. As a patient, he has a person. Patient, we don't diagnose, we don't find out. Every, I can assure you in this congregation, we should be having, if you do a test for CARS test, which is for autism, I'm quite certain I'll find at least about 70% of this population falling somewhere in the ASD. In fact, there is a study going on in uh, Bangalore right now where there is a questionnaire which we put across to the parents of people.
people of the skills in that ESD, and we find that parents have a problem by the name of child. It is transmitted, transferred. We have done that study. So uh, I can share the questionnaire with you. It's an open uh, questionnaire. You can do that among the population. You can find out how many of you have. It was very, very surprising to me when these students came to me. So we are not able to find anybody in the lower range. Everyone has high autistic rates. All my students, every student in Bangalore was, uh, has gone through the questionnaire as subjects and the, all of them, just one or two, they said are within the lower range of autistic rating. Most of them are high autistic rating. And we talk about prevalence of autism increasing. You know what is the latest prevalence? One in 45 children. One in 45 children are going to be autistic or are autistic right now. This is CDC data, Central Disease Control in the US. You can imagine what is the huge explosion. We all think or we all teach in our country that it's only the ability to see clearly. Vision involves understanding of what is seen and obtaining meaning from the visual information. Most of us lie when we teach you in your bachelors that I opted her it all goes to the hospital cortex. No. It's only the 70% of the fibers which are going to be the hospital cortex. Less so than if you go through a proper anatomy book, you will understand how much of interrelation is there with the other senses. I will not be in a position to stand there and talk to you if my vestibular cell system was not working well. I will not be able to read if my vestibular system is not working well. Where are the connections? That connection is happening from the vestibular system to my visual system. I will not be able to speak if my speech was not connected to the visual system. I will not be able to understand what you guys are talking if my visual system was not connected to my auditory system. So many connections are there. We don't understand. We always say vision is learned. Like the way you teach a child to walk, to stand up, to read, to understand something, to talk, vision is learned. So, a learned process can be done at any time. He has uh, a book today by Susan Barry. How many of you have heard of uh, this book called Fixing My Case by Susan Barry? Susan Berry was, she developed infantile esophobia, underwent three sprint surgeries, eyes became straight. But she was stereo blind. She had absolute zero stereosis. At the age of 40 odd, she met a doctor, a behavioral optometrist in the US called Dr. Rajero. And this lady said, okay, fine, let me give you a session of vision therapy. She says, but why? Because your stereopsis is zero. You cannot, you do not have any stereopsis. But uh, I'm a neuro neurobiologist. I know there's something called critical period. I'm 40 years old. I've crossed my critical period 30 years back. So it cannot happen. She says, okay, fine. Let's give it a try. She underwent sessions of vision therapy. I don't know how many sessions uh, she has written in that book. I don't remember the number of sessions. And the way she has described, she started having stereo vision. 
She went back to all the students and said, whatever I taught was wrong. Because there's nothing called critical period. Brain is totally plastic. There's a, something called neuroplasticity. Our own Dr. Ramachandran has given the best things in neuroplasticity. I don't know how many of you have heard of Dr. Ramachandran. He's a pioneer in neuroplasticity where he talks so much about it. How many of you have heard of Phantom Camp? Phantom Camp and Phantom Death? You heard of it? Anyone has heard of Phantom Man? No. The hand is not there, but you still feel that it is there. Yeah. So, they, a number of patients, hand is amputated or the leg is amputated and they complain of severe pain. Okay. So, what are you doing? Where is the problem? You don't have a leg. But then you say, I have very severe pain in my right leg. Connections. Connections in the brain. The part of the brain which is affected that leg is somewhere else. Where they are feeling that pain. Very interesting uh, <clears throat> case he has uh, talked about in one of the videos. He says, one of the patients complained of very severe itching in the foot. But the leg was amputated. So they did a lot of work on the patient. Finally, they found that if you itch over here on his cheek, the itching went off. So the connection in the foot was okay. Neuroplasticity. That's why when we talk of critical period today, what is critical period? Like? Uh, until what age does it uh, last? Sorry? After death, critical period stops. <laughs> so, up to what age can you treat amyopia? <laughs> after death, I not. So, till the time you are alive, I can treat amyopia. Right. So, we are training, and this training is critical for learning. Unless a person learns, we can train him to learn, we can train him to see. It is only that he has gone haphazard somewhere while he was learning to see, and that learning to see did not happen appropriately, and we can train that. The needed visual skills are visual acuity, obviously. I am not saying that visual acuity is not required. Not for once will I say that. Very important. By marker coordination and convergence, directionality, form perception, attention span, visualization. What is this? How many of you see a duck? What do you see, sir? You see a duck? Rabbit. Rabbit. How many of you see a rabbit? Rabbit with two ears. Okay, you see from this side to this side, it's a duck. And you see from that side to this side, it's a rabbit. Why am I saying this is because I can see a duck and a rabbit. If the directionality is a problem, okay, the child is reading from here to here and there to here and there to here, he has a problem with directionality. Will he be able to read? Read that. Now it is not a problem with his eyes. Visual at 366 or 2020. We'll check so many other functions. We'll check uh, four years, four years, this, that, everything we'll check. Everything is fine. Direct energy has a problem. What do you do? Simple things. This is a visual motor integration test. Winter heaven forms. What we do is ask the child to draw these figures. If your child is unable to draw these figures or copy these figures, can you expect him to write? 
Can you expect me to do that cursor, right? Did he not copy this? One of my patients, I always talk about her. It's mother. Hideous word. You tell her, draw a square, she'll make a perfect square. Tell her. You show her this. Ask her to copy this. Every single figure on earth, except square, will be drawn. Where is the problem? Her auditory motor integration is fantastic, but visual motor integration has a problem. I don't see many oldies over here, but then uh, when you go through the process, let me call you an oldie. <laughs> Find out it is Nepal. 
be a part of it. So if you are visual closure is poor, you have to expose the entire thing and then you find out it is. So if the visual closure is poor, accurate judgments need, will not be made of familiar objects. So once that happens, what happens to the person's understanding? Everything goes back. Visual, visual integration. Happens when visual skills integrate together, for example. If you look at the word Siamese and you saw a picture of that type of a cat in your mind, you'll be integrating two visual You're seeing the word Siamese and you're integrating that was how there was a chicken trick okay. You see a chicken trick off over there and you integrate it with the taste or whatever. Sequential memory. How many of you are good at learning phone numbers, remembering phone numbers? Phone numbers. How do you remember? Do you remember those 10 digits straight? No. You break it up into sequence and you remember it. Yes. And if the sequential memory is poor, you will never be able to remember it. We have something called Tagistos. You have huge sequences and a person is able to remember that. He breaks it up. So it's a person's ability to break it into sequences and understand and remember. Visual search, what do you find over there? In these two squares, you find something? Okay, let's pass the first one. What are the distractors in the first one? <coughs> Most people will say a zero over here. Or a four over here. What about this? All of you will miss out on the red X. And the second one, what do you see over here? All the same? This one. So how do we, how are we able to find it fast? We can print it. Visual concentration, ability to concentrate on a particular object. Visual scan, ability of the eye to move smoothly from, this is not pursuit, but scanning. I scan this entire population over here. I'm not performing a pursuit movement, I'm scanning it. Visual motor integration, eye-hand coordination, consists of coordinating visual perceptual skills together with cross motor movements and fine motor movements. Do you understand cross and the fine motor movements? This is cross. I'm holding this and using this as a fine motor movement. Now, how is it all going? The input and output. Now, you have a patient, a person, 6-6 six, six visual activity, everything is fine, everything is fine in the perceptual system, but he is like paralyzed. He says, what can you use? I am able to see you, I am able to do but then nothing is coming out of my mouth, I am not able to speak. My speech is motor function. If I'm not able to speak, will you even sit for a second over here? You just see me, my mouth going, but nothing comes up. Now you understand what vision is. You're seeing, no doubt I won't say that your visual ability is not important, very important. Your anterior posterior segment, very important. Visual functions. We are talking of visual efficiency, your accommodation, merchants, your pursuit studies. Visual efficiency, very important. After that, from your eye, it goes to the brain, going through the rest of the network. A lot of network in your brain. Going through all that, it is perceived. So your brain perceives it, and then it interprets. And that interpretation leads to an action whether it is cross motor movement or the fine motor movement, and unless this entire process happens, there is nothing called vision. When we talk of vision, it is from here, here, and back to the action. Unless that happens, 
I don't think there's anything that we have achieved in doing anything since then. So, what do you think? Do you think it's worthwhile infusing vision therapy? Or learning? No? This gentleman shares the advice on the other. So, if yes, go to the places of Biomarker Vision, come and attend my classes. Group the findings into various anomalies, we talk about it in the or something. Present a simple treatment approach and continue to learn the intricacies of vision Questions? Questions? Okay, thank you very much for this evening.